Tiffley Muskegon, it's Andy O'Reilly. We are at a brand new program that has just gotten opened up into Muskegon. Kind of coming up from out of Holland. It's called 70 times 7. I've got Nathan Johnson, right? Yep, that's me. Andrew Mann. Man, Andrew Mann. Yeah, I'm working on that guy's name. Andrew, hard to remember. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about 70 times 7. Now, I know a little bit about this reference. Yeah. I'm kind of a rusty Catholic, but I do seem to remember that there was something in the Bible about 70 times 7. Explain that to me. Well, 70 times 7 comes from a verse um, in, in the Gospels of Matthew, chapter 18. Jesus was having a conversation with one of his disciples, and he wanted to know how many times he had to forgive his brother. That's right. If he I continued remember. to get after him. And Jesus told him this. He says, you have to forgive your brother 70 times 7. I learned that twice in 7th grade because I did 7th grade <laughs> twice. I remember that now, but right. So we're talking a little bit about forgiveness and 70 times 7, and it's going to lead into what this mission's all about. It's about reacclimating people who have been in jail or prison over a long period of time, maybe a shorter period of time, and helping them find their way back into society, which is not always the easiest thing for these guys to do. I mean, you know, you got a guy that spends a couple of years yep. in jail, might be a little bit easier for him to get back in. But yep. what do you when, you, when you get into 10 to 15 to 20 years, tell me a little bit about what the transition's like when they make their way out. When guys are coming out, like, like you said, guys doing a short period of time, come home, family's still here. Yeah. Not much has changed in a year or two, right. especially with the family conditions. But you get a guy who's done 10, 15, 20 years, a lot of can happen. You know, uh, Grandparents could pass away. Parents could pass away. Um, children grow up. Sure. They could go in. Uh, when you get locked up, they could be five years old. You do 10 or 15 years. They're 15, 20 years old when they come home. And those are two, those are totally different mindsets from sure. a five-year-old to a teenager. And so there's a lot of different challenges. Guys um, will come home and one thing is just getting reacclimated back into society with the way that culture is now. Culture's you know? changed. I mean, culture exactly. changes in 10 years. Yeah. Culture changes in five minutes sometimes, yeah, it does. right? <laughs> so you go from just like cell phones and, and um, cell phones from the way that people dress, all that. So it's just coming, coming out and you're seeing all the, the different ways that things are happening because when you're locked up, I think at times um, your your mind will stop in the air or the Does time it? that you get locked up. Myself, I did 12 and a half years in Michigan prison system here, and so uh, you know why I got locked up in 2000, came home in 2013. But at the time in 2000, when it, my mind was still there, that was the last thing yeah. that I saw. When you go to prison, everyone wears the same outfit, same colors, everything for as long as you're locked up. For, mm. for 12 and a half years, all I saw was uh, blue with orange stripes. Is that it? That's it. And so you that. come home, um, a lot of things can change, family members. Um, and so when guys come home, first thing guys want to do is get to work. Yep. And so, and we want to, and that's what we're here. We want to be able to help meet that. Um, so the challenges are finding a place to stay. If a guy comes home after doing a long period of time, and parents or family members are around, they may have to go to transitional living yep. or community placement like at the rescue mission or a prisoner reentry home. Um, and so you really don't have a lot. So you really have to develop the attitude of learning how to be um, enjoy where you're at on the way to where you're going, understanding and realizing that this is just a temporary condition. This is It won't be like this forever. And so when the guys first come home, I start talking to him about that. Just it's, it's not going to be like this forever. No, nope. it's temporary. Just be content right now. Just kind of enjoy the fact that you don't have to do count time. Sure. Enjoy the fact that you don't have to go to the chow hall and eat that small portion of food. You, if you want, you could walk to McDonald's or you could go to Dollar Tree and buy, you know, five Dollar Tree burgers. <laughs> you know what I want to know? <laughs> Where do you find a Dollar Tree in town? I mean, there's, you, they're they're nowhere. Yeah. They're there's, everywhere. There's yeah. one on every corner. Right. Yeah. So when so I you know I said go in there. I tell the guys go in there because you guys don't come home with a lot of money. But nope. hey, it's better than eating in the chow hall. Sure. Be thankful you get to walk out and take a take a walk around the block. Yeah. You just get to watch cars go by. First step. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And so just enjoying those small things. Um, just the challenges of the pressures of everyday life. Am I going to be able to get a, a job? Well, what about a car? Mm -hmm. If I do get a job, how am I going to be able to get there? Because right now either you're walking. Or you're on a bike. Right. And so the, all those different thoughts come. But eventually, as guys have clear thoughts and um, they just kind of just come to grips, it is what it is, 
things begin to go smoothly. They don't yeah. move as fast as they want them to. Right. And we have a, a group of guys here at Kingdom Life that have been to prison, and we just kind of come walk alongside of them, do life with them, and let them know, hey, we've been there. I came home three years ago, or this guy came home five years ago. This guy came home 20 years ago. Look where we're at now. And it's a we were in the group. same. Yeah, and we it's, were in the. It's yeah. people grabbing each other and, and holding on. Exactly. Saying, hey, we don't want you to slip back down to where you were. Exactly. And they got guys like us to look at that sure. give them hope. Yep. So it's like, man, these guys did it. And I got a guy, uh, one of one of our leaders here, one of our pastors, Eric Cockrum, he did 15 years hmm. in prison. And so this is a guy, I did 12 and a half, and we got guys who've done a lot of time in here. And these guys, you can look at them and say, man, these guys did just as, mount, just as much time as I did, or even more, sure. and now they're doing good. Yeah, They have vehicles, they have a place to stay, they're working, uh, they're giving back through the ministry, they're giving back to the community, and it's like, man, it gives hope, because now you can look at someone who's been there and look what they're doing. I want to get to you in a minute, Andrew. Okay. I want to ask you one more question, though. Okay. When you were in, when you, were in yeah. when you did your time, yeah. Was there a moment where you knew that your life had changed? Yeah. It Talk did. about that. It was April 28, 2003. You never forget the date. I knew, you, you never, never forget, the, forget date. the date. I was sentenced by Judge Hicks um, on an armed robbery case for 12 and a half to 30 years. Judge Graves uh, sentenced me on a delivery of cocaine charge, 5 to 20. And there were two consecutive sentences. I had 17 and a half to 50 years when I went in. I was 19 years old. Mm. Went into the prison system. Um, uh, left there three several days um, after 9-11, okay. September 2001, rolled out to the state prison. Went out there, and I still stayed in my old way of thinking. Um, I was selling drugs, used to run over on the on the Mason Street end of town. They used to call me White Boy Nate because I was the only white guy selling crack in Muskegon back mm. in the 90s. And so uh, when I got to prison, stayed in that same mindset. My dad had begun to meet with a couple other couples and begin to pray for me once a week. And he had come home from Teen Challenge, a rehab place, mm. yeah, I know about Teen six Challenge. months before I, I, I got locked up. And so he came back. Um, he was meeting with his couple, um, two couples, and they would pray for me uh, every week. And so over a period of two years, they're praying for me. Um, eventually, an opportunity opened up with my case of being able to give some time back, get my time ran concurrent. And so at that time, there were, it seemed like there was hope now at the end of the tunnel sure. when this opportunity came up. And I just came to a place to where it was like, man, I can't keep doing this anymore. Yeah. It was like God used that specific situation to say, hey, you know, some things really have to change. And it, nothing happened right away, but God used that, um, that situation to begin to draw me to himself. And it wasn't until the following year in April um, that uh, through a number of circumstances, situations, and conversations with guys, that, that night in my cell, April 28, 2003, I remember coming off the big yard that night that um, I just I came to a place to where I was tired. The sin had worn me out, and I just cried out with an honest heart, genuine repentance, and I just said, man, look, it was an unorthodox prayer. I said, listen, I know I'm tore up from the floor up, but if you can do something with me, I said, you got me for the rest of my life, and I said, I won't argue with it. And so that, ne that, that night in my cell, while I'm sitting in my cell, we come off the big yard, and um, this, the gospel's truth, man, as soon as I finished praying, I didn't realize it. something on the inside of me. I didn't know it was Holy Spirit. He said, get everything that's in your cell and don't line up with the Word of God and get it out. And I went through, grabbed my cigarettes, music, whatever. If I felt the Bible said it was wrong, it was wrong. Got it and got rid of it. That was the first night since I was a kid I went to sleep with a clean conscience. That next morning when I woke up, what I had realized, I, I got off my bunk. I was waiting for the doors to break so I could go to the chow hall. And I was brushing my teeth and washing my face. And the first thing I noticed that God had supernaturally delivered me from cigarettes as if I never even smoked before a day in my life. And there was such an empire of peace that was so great on the inside of me, cuss words didn't even flow out my mouth anymore. And for me, that was a big deal. You know, I'm mean, just all over the place. And man, I just knew it. And that night, went to the yard, went out to the yard that night, and I told the guys um, that I was hanging out with that I said, I'm not with this stuff anymore. Yep. And I cut ties with them. Got introduced to some older Christian guys that were on the yard, and for the next 14 months while I was there until I was transferred to another prison, I got discipled by those guys. And then the first 10 years of my Christian life was spent inside the Michigan Department of Corrections, and uh, we used to, we called it Holy Spirit University because you got hands-on training mm -hmm. inside the Satan's playground on what this thing was all about. I, and I apologize. I get a little choked up. Yeah. But that exact same thing happened to me with alcohol. Mm. I knew the split second 
yeah. that it was done. Yeah. And it's a life changing, yeah. unbelievable feeling. It yeah. really is something else. So yeah. to know there's another guy out there yeah. that went through the same thing I did, <laughs> love it. Now back on to Drew. Let's yeah. get back on yeah. topic here for a second. Yeah. Talk about the job when when they get out. I mean, there's a lot of places that won't have anything to do with a felon. Yeah. Talk about the first steps that need to be taken to maybe change their mind about that and get okay. these guys back in the right, right, right path that they can do yeah. what they're meant to do. Yeah. First and foremost, before I answer your question, I'll say this is why we're here. Yeah. Right. This is true hope and real change. Yeah. Uh, and 70 times 7 is about servant leadership. And sure. that's what we're here for. We're yeah. here to serve others, to bring them to, you know, where they need to be. And help. And to help. That support. safety net. Yep. So when they come and they're ready and they go through the jobs for life, and jobs for life is, of course, we use. It's the soft skills. And sure. It helps them support and navigate through the interviewing process, what to wear to an interview, uh, just how to go to the day-to-day. And so we, we navigate them through that program and we, we help them kind of understand what a real work environment is because when you're incarcerated for so long, it can be tough. It's very tough. Because it's tough for individuals that aren't even incarcerated right. to be successful in, in, in an environment like that because it's cutthroat. It's fast paced. Yeah. You're getting feedback on the spot. How do you handle it? Right. And so we help them navigate through that. We help them get ready. We help them give back and, and be a member of society through paying taxes and through being just an engaged employee or an sure. associate because that's sure. all companies want. Mm-hmm. So what's the ROI, ROI for the employee, employers on that? And that's it. It's an engaged individual that's willing, that's going to be loyal, that's willing to put in the work, that has a mentor that matches them up. So that's one difference between our program. So it's, come, it's called New Day Staffing. So yeah, it's a staffing service, but we're a program first. Sure. So that's what separates us from everyone else. Mm-hmm. is is the program and so what they do is they get matched up with a mentor so as they go through the first 30 days the th- first 60 days then the 90 days they're able to navigate through those roadblocks awesome and they're able to to stay employed because that long-term success of providing for themselves and providing for their family is what we're about just to make them stand on their own two feet exactly and the feeling of being able to stand on your own two feet yeah. is remarkable i yeah. look back at my days and you know i'm not getting too far off topic again but when i drank I mean, I'm almost 30 years old, and I'm still going to my mom for 50 bucks every other week, yeah. you know, just to get by or get booze or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, if she starts trying to offer me money, I'm like, eh, I really don't want it, you know. And I mean, I'm 13, 14 years into it now, yeah. but, you know, she's still being mom, yeah. you know. So I, 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 I get it. I really yeah. do. I understand what it is to stand up on your own two feet mm-hmm. and, and be a part of that. You mentioned earlier, before we came on, yeah. we were talking about the, the people that get out of prison and then end up back. Yes, Muskegon's got a pretty high rate. Yeah, it's called recidivism. Recidivism. Yes. Big and, word. Yeah. And it's actually, Muskegon County itself is okay. actually right in line with the state rate, and that's 34%. So you get out of prison, 34% chance you're going back. Correct. What a waste. And, well, I mean, what a, that's terrible. It is. It, it's, it's very high. But you mentioned Holland, too. Yeah, Holland. So this 70 times 7 here in Muskegon yep. is, is we're doing the same exact programming that Holland has been doing for years. Yep. So that mm-hmm. three-year time period where that rate in the county of Muskegon, as well as the state, Hollands is at 6%. 6% recidivism. That means that it's, it's successful and it works. That's huge. That's huge. We're going to put all the links up here on Positively Muskegon. You can find these guys' website. You can find their Facebook page. D- do you accept donations? We do, and there's a donation click button on the website. Is there? Yeah. Perfect. If you got an extra buck or two to help these guys out, this is where change happens, and I'm here to yeah. tell you what. So just hearing this guy's story, Nate's story here for a few minutes today, that's powerful. And that, that's, that's life-changing. And for him to take everything he knows and change lives too. Yeah. I mean, I've spent a little bit of time doing it myself. Yeah. So uh, amazing. 70 times 7 right here in Muskegon. Make sure you get all the details on the, on the blog. You will put all the links right here, of course. And, you know, I'm, we got one little last message to send. Right. Annie Donawald. Yeah, you're, we're talking to you. We want you out here sometime to tell your story, too. Yeah. Mutual friend of ours, Annie Donald-Walls. She's yeah. pretty powerful, too. Guys, thanks for the great work. Thanks, Annie. This is, to me, this is a game changer, and this is something that we, we need to be very, very proud of in Muskegon and really embrace. So do what you can to learn a little bit more about 70 times 7. Nathan, Andrew, thanks so much. Yeah. Positively Muskegon.